uh, again, welcome. And um, I hope you enjoy our, our recital. Um, the first uh, grouping of pieces is Vivaldi's Seasons, and I took one movement from each season. Um, and uh, as you can see, there's going to be a slideshow accompanying this, this piece. Um, and I'm curious to see how you enjoy the slideshows. Um, in the autumn, it goes through where it's the harvest party. So there's, think of um, festives, and, and then after everybody's been partying too much, they all pass out. So <laughs> you'll see that. Um, uh, and then some or the winter is where uh, you're cozy inside by the fire. And actually, Vivaldi wrote about raindrops outside, and Dave is the raindrops, um, but we have snow, but this year, I guess, we're more raindrops. And then spring, you really feel the, the, see the birds and everything, and then summer is the storm. And I guess that's all, did you want to, Vivaldi's a Baroque composer. Yeah, yeah, he was in a Baroque uh, period, Italian, and uh, despite the fact that um, uh, Bach was such an, uh, famous and powerful Baroque composer. He actually drew some inspiration from Vivaldi. His churches would sometimes send him down to check out what Vivaldi's doing to make sure like he's not missing anything, you know? And, um, and I, I think you can see why he's just, he's very recognizable and way ahead of his time to write something very impressionistic almost. He writes about seasons and it kind of sounds like it, but it's in a very Baroque style. It's something that I don't even know if we could emulate today because we're so out of the time, so. Please enjoy these uh, selections. Probably the, they, they, they fit really well. I just hope you enjoy them. Thank you. 
came off in the middle. <coughs> okay. Thank you. 
Keep uh, to to keep Beth in the show and let her take a break. I'm gonna play some uh, piece by myself. Uh, this is a piece by Gabriel Fauré. It's his fourth Barker roll, and um, as the term Barker roll implies, it is um, 
the water. Um, he was uh, uh, French, and he did like his gondola rides, um, as all French people probably do. And uh, uh, he was a tenor, so his uh, melodies are very lyric, but um, they're also in the tenor range, typically. So you'll hear uh, a single melody come out over the rest of this piece, and you'll feel the flowing water beneath. It's kind of like a gondola song, if you could fit a piano on a gondola, really. Thank you, and enjoy.
The next piece we're playing um, is by a composer who really needs no introduction. It is Beethoven. And um, did he write more than one romance or violin, piano? He wrote two romances. And um, this piece, uh, it's strange because rondos are typically fast and fun. They're typically uh, pieces where a theme comes and then something else happens in between. It repeats over and over and over. And it's quick, it's fun, it's lively. Usually the end of a sonata, like which what Beethoven wrote. But this romance is a rondo, but it's slow and uh, very, very beautiful. But the in-between parts are incredibly challenging for violin. Not so bad for piano, but very hard for violin. Is there anything you'd like to say? You know, uh, Beethoven was certainly a, pa a passionate person and composer, and, um, but his romantic life was never uh, very successful. He always fell in love with the wrong woman uh, who was already married or unavailable. So um, anyway, this, this romance um, goes through a lot of emotions, so it's not less la-la, there's some other stuff in there. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, off to a different part of the world now, into uh, Paris, um, different from where uh, Beethoven was composing, was a man named Chopin, and uh, where Beethoven had to uh, struggle to find love, Chopin actually had to, to beat the women back pretty badly. He was known as a poet at the piano, and um, yet he was very reclusive. His music is incredibly romantic, it's in, it, incredibly sensitive, and he goes through um, uh, changing keys effortlessly, and it gives it a very... Um, the, the best word for it is a romantic feel, and of course that's uh, why he is one of the most pivotal composers in the romantic era. And um, this piece is a waltz. He wrote a lot of waltzes. Everything he wrote was very good uh, for the piano. Um, this particular waltz uh, is probably too strange to dance to. You can try if you really feel moved, but it gets going really quick at some points. And his waltzes were less for partying and for dancing and more for um, an expression of his own uh, unexpressed uh, musicality. piece is actually three dances that we've put together and they're not necessarily in order but it was the way we wanted to do it 
um, there by Béla Bartók, and um, he's Hungarian, and he is famous for um, many things, but one of them is that he and another composer, Kodai, um, went over the countryside and listened to the folk tunes that the peasants and the gypsies were playing. And um, these are some of the fragments of the tunes that he, um, he put together in, in these dances. The first dance is um, he wants to emulate some kind of ancient flute. Uh, and I'm going to show you how I'm going to do that on the, the violin. Um, and how I'm doing that, it's a harmonic, what I'm doing. And um, a, a vibrating string will divide itself, and if you hit the nodes, you'll, you'll hit a harmonic. Now, I'm, we call these false harmonics because we're creating them by stopping the string, as we do, and then we lay our fourth finger, which happens to be right at the, the right node, so you can play a tune that way. So that's what I'm doing. I'm um, not scritching, on, I mean, I'm scritching on purpose. <laughs> okay. Okay, and then it goes on to, uh, oh, and a lot of these pictures uh, I took in Europe myself when we went with the Sebastopol School. Uh, the second dance is, um, I kind of just, I kind of think it's just kind of like, I call it a jumping dance. And um, so as you, you'll see that the students were taking pictures of them jumping. Um, so, but, so it's lively. And then the third dance is a very passionate one. And I thought, when I was in Europe, I was so impressed, of course, by the art in the buildings and in the stained glass and in the statues and the f famous. And to me, that is very, that is passion. That is where the root of, of where our, our heart and soul are. So that's the one, two, three.
Um, back to Beethoven again. I absolutely love him. I could play an entire Beethoven concert. I don't know if I physically could, but I would absolutely love to. His um, music does uh, um, display so much depth, despite the fact that his, uh, his sequences of music are so short. It's like he's, he can't even say a full sentence with music, and yet he keeps piling them together, and they turn into a, a, a composition that doesn't make so much sense to your mathematical brain, but it makes sense to your heart and your soul. So um, this piece is uh, from his pathetic sonata, and pathetic means with extreme amounts of emotion. And this sonata um, was written eh, towards the time when he was starting to lose his hearing. Uh, this piece itself from the sonata has been turned into a lot of pop standards, and um, one of them is uh, by Billy Joel, entitled This Night. It's a song that he wrote, and uh, I really can't remember what album it's on, but um, he did a good job. And Billy Joel wrote uh, this, this uh, song based on Beethoven's piece because he grew up playing classical music. He grew up playing Beethoven. Anyway, this piece is a wonderful piece, and um, I am going to get to it in a second. I apologize for talking so long. The, uh, you'll hear something very strange happening in this piece, and it'll sound sometimes like there's um, more than one hand playing, and the, the effect is made by um, different kinds of finger pedaling and specific kinds of fingering. So anyone interested in piano playing at all should pick up uh, different editions of music when you play. This one is uh, Arter Schnabel's edition. So the fingering, as weird as it is, I swear to God, the guy like cut off his pinky finger. But as weird as it is, is incredibly effective for playing the piece. So just... Um, if you're interested in uh, it's just some small bits of information for you, no. Thank you. Enjoy the piece.
Okay, so um, we're coming in the home stretch here. Um, the next, we put together two pieces that are um, uh, kind of uh, from the Arabian area. Um, anyway, I learned that it wasn't really belly dance music. I, I discovered that this um, folk tune <laughs> is really a dance called the uh, Camel Caravan. So the way they dance it is the people make a chain and dance like camels or something. Uh, <laughs> so, um, but it's really a, a very passionate, um, uh, I love the, the scale that, that they use. And then the, it coincides with the Russian composer Cesar Kiwi. Kiwi, how do you say that? Anyway. And uh, that's very interesting because there's pizz left hand pizzicato in there and whatever. Yeah, I think you'll enjoy these dance pieces. Um, that scale she's talking about, it's your harmonic scale. It gives it that kind of what we call like this e Egyptian sound. It's not really, but that kind of thing. And um, yeah, uh, uh, Cesar QE was um, around the same time as Rachmaninoff, just to give you kind of like a, a timeline perspective.
Um, I'll start out talking about the boring theoretical stuff, and I'm going to hand it over to Beth because she has something cool about this piece. Um, uh, the, the bumblebee etude, an etude is an exercise. Um, you've all probably heard the bumblebee etude, and uh, rims, uh, originally written by Rimsky Korsakov. Uh, Rachmaninoff took it and made it the, the famous piece that was played in Shine that you hear. It's all like crazy piano up and down. And then um, this guy, Jack Fina, around the same time, said, I like the Bumblebee etude as well, but I also like boogie-woogie dancing. So he decided to take a boogie-woogie bass and, and put the Bumblebee etude on top. And um, despite the fun sound of it, it is, it is quite challenging. It does retain that etude uh, property while also being uh, a boogie. I don't even know how to boogie, but it's, it's awesome. Um, well, I, I, uh, it's really a piano solo, and I took, I, I wrote myself a part uh, <laughs> Got to join in. Um, one thing I wanted to say that um, I first heard this piece um, because my husband, who's sitting back over there, um, played it for me when I first met him. And I thought it was so cool. But he didn't have the music. He was just doing it by um, whatever memory. So um, at the time, we didn't have computers. But then I went on Amazon, and I was able to find a used part. And so then I wrote this. hope you like it. Thank you. 